Hello and welcome to the Metronome Sessions, brought to you from the Metronome venue at the heart of Nottingham. We are so pleased, proud and honoured to end our International Women's Day with such an amazing producer, engineer, mixer. So can you welcome to the virtual stage, Marta Saloni. Hello, Marta. Nice to Hello. see you. How are you? Nice to see you. Thank you. I'm very well. How are you? Good, thank you very much. It's been such a great day and we are so honoured to have you close it for us. We've got some absolutely brilliant mixes for you, um, sent in from all over. And the idea of tonight, everybody, is that Marta's going to cast her professional ear over the mix and production of them and offer some opinions, because after all, mixing is an opinion. Um, we had so many sent in, we've curated them into sort of different genres so we're not hearing the same thing over and over again. So if your mix didn't get chosen, please don't be disheartened. There's so much you can get from tonight. So without further ado, let's kick off with the first track. And that is sent in um, by Anfonsi Moxon. Nice way to kick off. Marta, what are your thoughts? I really like this mix actually. I so I listened to this uh the Samita mixes earlier through my speakers because I knew I was gonna wear headphones. I wanted a, a clear representation for like different speakers and uh, an impro tools, you know, check uh specifically um all the aspects. And uh, uh I took some notes and I remember. I really love the use of the dynamic in this mix. I thought it was it was excellent. Um, and how the vocals are panned is also very interesting because they're not just fully centered. I and mean, there are a lot of text, texture voices moving around. And that's uh, something that I really like doing in my mixes as well. Um, what I noted uh, was that when I listened through my speakers, I noted that on the first time they, the vocals come in, um, they're panned slightly to one side. Then there is a little gap and then the vocals, I was almost feeling them, they could have moved to the different side to, keep, to give the mix a bit more, uh, let's say more of a mirror effect, like, so like a call a response. And then um, uh, to give the second part, that same second part, more variation, my note was also to perhaps, if I would have raised the sense or added more of the high frequencies to make it feel like a journey, more like a lift. So 
sometimes that can happen with uh, volume automation, but equally I'm going to make an EQ automations or just the top end rising. It doesn't really add volume across the whole spectrum of frequency, but you're just carving uh, out space for the top end to rise and that uh, augments the feeling of excitement. Um, then a few other suggestions that I thought if, um, uh, it's Anne Sophie, right? Who submitted the mix? Is that? Um, That's that right, Anne Sophie. Anne Sophie. Um, uh, a few suggestions if, if, if Anne Sophie is open to experiment with a few effects. Um, for uh, tracks like these, which are uh, very rhythmic, so like there is the um, there is uh, the beat that is clearly there, and I really like how present it is. And then there is the vocal, it's almost like the two main elements to it. I think um, it's always quite exciting for me in a, in a mix that it's got similar um, qualities to to play with the interaction between the two. So what I uh, will play around with is rhythmic um, effects. Like for example, uh, delays that are uh, synced in with the kick drum or um, adding a reverb that is side-chained to the kick drum so that the kick drum always shines through and there's these elements of um, the reverb like compressing the reverb after the uh, the side chaining and um, having this other element that pumps with the vocals and with the kick and so it gels the two together and sort of forms this um, uh, these third instruments within them all. Um, and also because there's been a quite steady beat uh, to add variation, I sometimes will use spot effects like just adding a, a dot to dave delay in some in some parts or adding uh, a reverb spot uh, somewhere just to give it like that accent and uh, yeah. keeping the track uh, fresh. Marta, you mentioned delay well a couple of times, but do you typically sync it to tempo? Or do you swing it around by ear to, to give a feeling? I sometimes like not to sync it to tempo because it it brings that element of happy accident and chaos that sometimes a mix really needs. So, um, and sometimes I get sessions that don't have a tempo, so it's just you know uh, an unknown entity for, to me. But. For tracks like this, where I will start off with uh, seeing like tempo based delay, but again, like to have if we don't have a BPM or if the BPM is in between, or you know, we could always add uh, use whatever's in the beat to keep the tempo. So, like using the side chain and then almost whatever um, you've got going on, if side chain it to the kick, that means or or the sound is gonna keep in tempo with the track. So, that's it's all internal clock, it's all internal logic we use yeah. instead of BPM. The, um, the, the point about raising high frequencies, that's a really, really interesting trick because it's not adding any extra instrumentation. You're just using what's there, but enhancing it as the journey goes on. That's a really good, uh, good trick the chat room can definitely learn from, and as can I, so thank you for that. Some really good feedback there, thank you very much. Right, let's move on to our next one. Uh, we've got Jamie Whiting now. Hesitation. Why do I feel? Stop. I'm incapacitated. Stop. These 
What do you think, Marta? That's quite a difference from the first track. Yeah, very different. So um, different approach to the mix, for sure, there. Uh, what I thought is that, to me, the cymbals were quite loud uh, in the mix and in the drums. And I would have loved to hear more kick and snare. Uh, the cymbals kind of getting in the way of the top end of the vocals as well. and um, the vocal themselves, I would have um, liked to uh, hear them a little bit more within the mix. And that doesn't just mean having them maybe a tiny bit quieter, but perhaps adding a, um, a multiband compressor, either on the vocal channel itself or, or on the uh, uh, master bus. Because that to me does a great deal when I mix and uh, I want the vocals to be up there and powerful, but yet I don't want them to feel like a different a different um, entity disconnected from the mix. So what works for me is not just um, a compressor. I usually use an SSL bass compressor on the master, followed by a few other things. And then just as I said before the, um, the limiter that I use to send off um, for the artist to listen to. Yeah, uh, and then yeah. take away for mastering. I use a multiband compressor is that really does help to me just shaping the mix in a way that the vocals can go loud and in the choruses if I turn them up in the mix and they still hit a threshold that keeps them in check and makes the mix feel like a, a one identity. So that's what I would focus on for that mix is um, um, the guitar sound could have been a little bit louder as well as what I thought. You know, mo mostly focusing on the drums and bringing up the kick in the snare and uh, and the vocals perhaps making them sit a little bit yeah a little bit better when you when you're mixing something with, with a live band feel like that would you approach the drums uh, and and use augmentation with samples or does it depend on the project but is it is there a go-to okay i'm going to use these samples on this this drum kit um well depends if i if i record uh that band i would have already sorted out during the recording side but um, and I don't usually end up using um, samples to reinforce, but when I do mix, I really like to work with what I have. And uh, if then down the line of the first mix draft, then the, the artist says, I'm really missing some attack and I cannot achieve that adding um, one or two K to the kick drum, then I start going into the, uh, um, my, my sample library yes and i use trigger which i think is a really great um yeah um plugin i used to use battery which uh, is convert transients to midi uh, but then you had to check every single one because it was yeah. is slightly late and, you know once you start adding uh samples then there is a problem with phase in case um you know you've got to check the sample and and what you are uh triggering from have the same phase alignment otherwise you yeah. just cause a problem rather than solving it. Yeah. Marta, one of the, one of the 
biggest uh, issues a lot of people who are home recordists um, and non-professional recordists have two things really recording drums of, uh, because of lack of mic lack of rooms so typically in a studio you might record with maybe a dozen mics at home you might have three or four um, and vocals as well so just just going a little bit more into into drums if you had um, just a normal rehearsal room of four mics what mics would you buy and where would you put them I actually record around with quite cheap mics so uh, I love a 57 on the snare and if I've got two I will use top and bottom and check the face because usually bottom be uh, out of face and uh, I will use a D12 or D112 on the kick drum and uh, if possible uh, I would use a uh, NSTM cone uh, turn into a microphone uh, in front of the kick drum too. doesn't have to be an NSTM cone but you know those things break yeah, easily. So. A sub. A sub. Yeah. Um, and then I mean, if we have the um, if we have the luxury of having overheads, then they don't need to be super expensive. They can just be condensed to condensers. And I think for a uh, for a small place, then that's fine. That's you know the overheads will catch the uh, the hi hat and they will catch the um, all the symbol kind of array. And uh, if there is a track which is heavy on the toms, then I would use fifty eights to to um uh to mic the toms or four two ones and that i think that's the kind of like um uh so these are basic recording setup that i will use it doesn't cost much um so. for the uh our audience is that you're not pulling out boutique mics that cost <laughs> thousands um if you had um instead of overhead you had a room mic what might you put what sort of processing might you put on a on a room mic uh, so that's where it gets expensive. So if money is not object, the room I would be my posh mic. I would use a 67, which, okay, then that skyrockets our price. But uh, I'm really fond of using a, a smash mic, which I kind of consider a room mic because, of, because it picks up basically most of the room. Uh, I sometimes use an Omni, uh, whichever Omni, really. It doesn't matter because it's ending into a compressor that's going to, completely uh, <laughs> obliterate any sort of uh, uh, quality that he might make it distinguishable from one to the other. So an Omni uh, dynamic microphone or a, uh, again, like a 58 or a 57, I would put it um, in between, like underneath the, the drummer's seat, pointing on the uh, kick drum, also pointing at the snap. And then I would just really compress it. And then what I used to love, I don't have anymore, is a, a drummer compressor, which can pick up, I think, for 200 pounds. And it's a really good compressor. It has an output, which I think is a genius idea because having an output means that you can drive it, you can drive it into it, and then you can turn it down. It's not going to just enter your DAW or your tape, an incredible volume. That's like a closed room. And then for... Um, Let's say a room I really love using, uh, maybe like a large diagram, uh, diagram condenser if it's possible, uh, but those get expensive um, in front of the kit because that really gels everything together and I will put it through a gentle um, compressor, which I mean, um, again, I, I feel lucky obviously to use, I would use something like an LA2A. Um, if that's not in the uh, in the budget, I would go for anything that can that can be not too pumped, you know, in in comparison to the drummer, which I instead I would properly uh, go hard with. Um, yeah, so those the two options. Okay, thank you. And in terms of like LA two A, you would use a plug-in equivalent, uh, or or would you? Do, can you tell the difference between the real thing and uh, a plug-in? Or, or we'll be on that stage now? Well, uh, they're very, the, the plugins that are out there, like for example, the uh, Universal Audio, they're great. Yeah. You know, I use the LA2A. They've got all of the um, models for it too, which is beautiful. Um, I, yes, I can tell the difference because I will use an LA2A to track and I would really always, uh, I know it so well, but obviously each unit is different from the other. Yeah. So, you know, um, there is a, a quality to it, uh, tracking it 
through that and then there is a different quality to it adding it later on as a as a plugin but it's not that one is better than the other i just think that like obviously if i have it there in front of me i'll use it to track if i don't then i'm gonna use the uh, um the plugin instead because after all what matters is where you put it the microphone just yeah. to record because it, it can sound terrible as a source and i will spend more time tuning a drum kit than than you know than pulling my hair out because i don't have a real that i try that's a good point so at source you need the drum kit to sound good because the microphone will only amplify what's there and if it doesn't sound really good it won't sound very good in a door yeah. or tape and just to just to go on the uh, the kick and snare what we've got the mics what sort of processing might you do to a kick and snare typical sort of great your greatest hits of kick and snare processing I do love an 1176, uh, the Uri, the blackface one. Yep. Um, that's what I would use if it's, if it's available. I like a 1081, I need a preamp and it has an EQ as well coming with it. And both of these are available like as plug-in versions as well. Uh, I never used um, the preamp emulation to to track with, but I'm sure it's, it's pretty damn good probably considering the technology we have now. So my chain would be Kick and Snare uh, 1081, 1176, and then coming back into Pro Tools to take depending, I will EQ uh, as well after compression because I, I, I feel like compression sometimes it will bring up elements that I don't want in the mix, like around 200, and maybe I'll, I'll look around that to cut it yeah. to um, make sure I have space for everything else. And in terms of types of reverb you might put on drums, do you have any go-tos for that, Marta? I love the Valhalla reverb, uh, the vintage verb, which is yeah. great. It's like, again, like it's quite cheap, it's $60. Yeah. $60. Um, and then otherwise, uh, spring reverbs I'm a huge fan of, and uh, plate reverbs if there are. Um, and I'm, I always like having in the chain of my reverbs, having like a very short uh, delay, like a stereo delay, and then adding a reverb after, because what the stereo delay does on a very short setting, it, um, it just spreads the sound, like it widens it. So I like the added width, and that's what I use a lot so in my, especially snares, um, snare reverbs, or my vocal reverb, uh, most, most of them have uh, a delay. Really good tip, right? Let's dig into another mix then. So we've now got um, James Dolby. <laughs>
Brilliant. James Dolby, what do you think, Marta? I was really into this one, actually. Um, I really like the low end and the clarity. I thought it was um, a, it was a really good mix. Uh, and I mean, my suggestion would be just, just you know, go for it even more with uh, well, the uh, the automations and the, the panning. You know, it's very, very creative um, composition, and it, it came through the mix as well. Um, and there was one particular note which I wrote is, um, uh, you know, the dramatic changes like the one of one minute 26. I would just say, just make it even bolder, just, uh, you know, change something completely um, essential, like just EQ the master just for that section, automate the master so that it just feels like suddenly like a completely different, um, a completely different track, but like things like that, I find them really interesting. I once, I remember mixing this track, I automated, I put a, a reverb on the master and then automated the um, uh, the different spaces. I At the time I was using all the verbs, so uh, it's just really processing heavy. It was, it was the sound of someone moving from one room of these imag imaginary house I was in and listening to the band from the living room and then I cross-faded it too with the reverb and going up the stairs, you know, all the is going this crazy, very specific post-production effects. You know, things like these that are very, very fun to do. So once you've got a mix, which is already really good and it's, and it's fun, it's got all these elements to it, then you kind of just want to see how, how far you can push it. Um, see Martin, it when, you, when you receive, uh, particularly Electronica, which is, is sort of very on the grid, um, as a mixer, do you think it's part of your job to take bits out or do you think that, that stage has been because it's been produced? But do you th if it helps the mix, do you feel the need to mute things? I wouldn't mute things unless artist, the artist tells me that I'm free to. Um, but there are many ways in which I can uh, prioritise things through EQ. So I can uh, effectively having something still there but not almost like for it not to be so perceivable or not like in the in the rank of like priorities in the track wouldn't I can mask things to make them sound uh, still there but not as perceivable as before so there are ways that uh, things can coexist uh, though I wouldn't take them out as in muting a yeah. hardcore mute unless I have a uh, you know, the trust of the artist uh, or like whatever, you know, it's something that you build, I think. And, so. and typically, how many artists will approach you saying you've got a free hand, you've got perspective, do what you want, and how many are quite kind of just mix what's there, don't touch anything else, just raise the faders, that's, that's what I'm giving you. How, what's the sort of split? How much free reign do you have? Well, it's the more I mix and the more I, I build, uh, let's say, like a... a like uh, the more I built a career out of it, the more people feel uh, that they can just give me um, free creative uh, domain on their mixes because they know they've heard what I do, so they know um, what in my 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 comeback, and they know I wouldn't do something crazy like adding a vocal on top of it. You yeah. Know? Um, but uh, I also very respect sometimes. Uh, an artist who will say, well, look, I really love my mix of this. Um, stick closely to the reference mix, uh, but do your thing and add what you feel is missing. And I really like that too, because that means that I am building upon something which is already dear to them. So it's not a question of like me making the track, uh, me making the artist like the track again, because probably they've listened to it so many times, mm -hmm. but I'm working with something which I'm really happy with. So it's also a very privileged place to be. Sometimes there might be the like, in an, in an album, when I mix, um, maybe more like, uh, um, like processing heavy tracks uh, where the artist already gone in and done a lot of processing. Sometimes I would just ask for a stem with all the vocals, with exactly all the processing that the artist has done already, um, because I don't want to go and like redo things that yeah. they already have. You both say, I just always start from a place of um, where the artist is 
Um, before we go to the chat room, I've got a specific question about the new Horrors single, which you've mixed. Is that right? Yes. And it's quite a departure for, for them. And they're, they're known for sort of changing lanes every couple of albums. What sort of relationship did you have with those? Did they approach you because of the work you've done? And did, you, did they go, right, we want to go a different direction? Off you go. Yeah. So basically, they approached me saying, go for it. Push, push it to the max and, and even further, you know, it's... I wanted to sound exciting, I wanted to sound off the scale. So I had to go for it, uh, protecting my ears, but also like just pushing it the, as much as I could. And it was really fun because there, there wasn't any limit. The only limit would be these now sound fried. But yeah. you know, in that need to get you need to get past that point to know where the edge is. So you know, we, we pushed it, we pushed it past the point and went back. So was there a, quite a lot of to and fro? You'd send them mixes and they went, oh, a little bit too far. Or did you sort of get it in the in the ballpark the first time, just with a couple of tweaks? It was like, we got it in the ballpark first time. And then we were kind of like going, uh, we were tweaking from there. It was mostly like, okay, this sounds great, but can you push even more and see yeah. what that does? You know, it's, it's always like that. I think it's usually, with mixes, it's just I start with draft one and then I do draft one updates and then draft two, draft three. It never really goes like, I mean, it depends, it really I'm in touch wood, but it, I never gone to draft 11, you know? And I'm usually don't, usually between draft one and draft three, we've got it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's because it's, you know, it's, it's about communication. Um, and I know, you know, I, I know what I knew already what they were after is about giving each other references and stuff. Yeah. And in terms of mix revisions, are you using a lot of outboard and you print it to Pro Tools or whatever you use so you can revise mixes really easily? I always bring back to Pro Tools because um, having been an engineer and on a system before and I've done a lot of uh, recall sheets, um, I know that once you change a bit of uh, analog equipment in mine, come back ever again so to avoid that i print all my processing going back into the mix as i'm doing them so if i'm using my studer to mix i will stem it out at the end of um, mix draft one let's say i will stem out if i do any specific eq if i know that the band or the artist is committed to exactly understanding the fact that once i zero my desk the mix is gone, then I go from one track to the other and then we sign off one track and then move on to the other. Yeah. Uh, so it really depends. But uh, yeah, I usually don't take recall sheets because I rather go for it methodically um, and um, yeah, printing it back as I, as I do it. Brilliant. Thank you, Marta. We've got some questions in the chat room. Over to Ken. Hi, Marta. Nice to meet you. Hi there. We've got some uh, questions from uh, general public and some of our students here as well. So uh, a lot of questions about uh, the different monitors that you use, uh, including a uh, hot topic on the chat is your headphones that you're wearing. Um, what are they? And people are intrigued with that. But just how many different monitors and what are the different types of monitors that you use when you're going through the mix process? Um, I use a lot of uh, monitors, but as I when I mix, I use mostly two because I think it's, it's good to keep it simple, which um, are my main monitors, Genelex with a sub, which is underneath my desk. And then my other monitors are the Dynodio BM15, I think. Um, not very good with models, but they're behind me. I don't know whether you can see them. So these are my two mains. My, well, let's say main A, Genelex, main B, Dynodio. And then I've got, um, ah, got a little portable, it's called Anchor. Um, it's one of those that you can kind of have in your living room. I have a Sonos speaker, which has an aux in, um, which is very bassy. Um, but I like to mix on that, to check my mixes on that, because it's also a brand that is owned by many people. My headphones are Bayer, Dino ba Bayer Dynamic. Hang on. Bayer Dynamic DT 770 Pro. Um, 
80 homes because they've got different uh, homes in their line. Uh, I like it because uh, they've got a great base reproduction and the high end is there, but it's not harsh. And because they have a long cable and uh, because they keep your ears warm in winter and you can wear them on the underground when to go there. Well, I haven't been in one forever, but when I used to have long journeys to my studios, which once was in West London, and so you know, on the underground, spending an hour uh, each way, so two hours per day, these one cap your ears very well. And to me, it was just I was enjoying listening back to my mix on the way back and making notes. And um, they had to go enough power not to sound quiet when you're listening on a, on an iPhone. And yeah, the old iPhone as well. Sometimes I just send mixes to my email and then I play them back just literally like this. So I think it's the best way to mix a track is to decide on one pair of speaker and decide on a second pair of speaker and then just listen in which, as many environments as you can. Like in the car, if you have one, I have a car. I listen to things in my car and um, a home and there's so high fire home so yeah the, the most the more speakers you have the best obviously i'm going mad with like you know <laughs> an array of 15 speakers but it's useful can another question okay yeah um what are the struggles of mixing songs in terms of music production and how can you overcome them well mixing songs in terms of uh, music production so when the uh, doesn't mean whenever I feel like there is a um, something that can be improved, like in terms of production side. I think so. Yeah, I think thing. Yeah, if, like we were talking before, if there's a if there's something in there that you, John was asking if you can maybe change something, mute something out. Maybe if you see something's wrong, what are the challenges with that? Right. So yeah, sometimes I, if I feel that something is missing from the production that is not uh, serving the mix properly, so. I cannot, for example, push a chorus uh, as much as I want because I'm feeling that uh, there isn't an extra element in there that generates that lift I'm looking for. I try and go in and, and basically make make that myself. So I will, I could either add a, a, a sub bass uh, enhancer like R bass, for example, by waves, and just add it as a sort of like as a, in a parallel or as a send. And uh, if I want the mix to expand in um, in frequency spectrum in the choruses, that I, that's something that I often look for. I would get that in for the chorus, and I will I would um, split, for example, if there if let's say there are uh, synthesizers uh, running across the track, but they're always the same, and there isn't any additional part for the chorus. I might duplicate the track and split it in two tracks and put. A, uh, a doubler on on the duplicated track. So the doubler, what you will do, uh, the doubler I, I use is uh, is the waves one. Will push the uh, the dynamic, uh, sorry, the uh, the width, and so it will effectively make it sound wider. Though it's the same scent, is just having a completely different treatment, and, and so it adds that element of um, of lift because it's a top end lift. And then the lower end lift in the adding a sub bass to uh, to the bass. So I would try and automate uh, plugins to do that, automating width, automating um, uh, delays. You can you can really form uh, a lot of patterns if you play around with the feedback of a delay. If you feel like you're missing a layer of something, uh, there's a lot of tricks like that that uh, can be done if you feel like a production doesn't have exactly everything you need. Brilliant. Let's go to our next mix, which is Tom John Hall. I have a question. Oh, go on. How do I not get to, um, I'm getting a return of sound when you play the mix um, through audio movers. This is like a, my, my question to you. Audio You're question. getting a return of sound, what do you mean? So I think I'm hearing you right now. Yeah. Uh, this and uh, the sound coming through your speakers, and then I'm hearing audio movers as well. Is there a way that I can mute you? Uh, audio movers, should you should only hear audio movers when we play the mix? So it's audio, movers going down the webinar as well. audio movers going down the webinar as well. Yeah. That's how 
of the attendee is thinking of the trend. Okay, so. so you mute, mute Zoom. If you mute Zoom. How do I mute Zoom? <laughs> Are we all tuned into this, everybody? You get a free Zoom, uh, Zoom tips. Um, I think it's the bottom left. You should have an, uh, an icon. Oh, uh, mute myself. Okay. No, no. If you click the little icon next to it and then click leave computer audio. If you click leave computer audio. Uh-huh, okay. And then when the, the song ends, you would click that back on. I see, thank Let's you. Let's see if this works, everybody. <laughs> like tomorrow's world for those old enough to know. Okay, we've got Tom John Hall's mix. Are we back, Marta? We are back. Are we that back? It worked. It's like yes. an audio professional. I know, right? You never thought I've got a couple of awards even. <laughs> well Don't done. tell the MPG. <laughs> um, what do we think to Tom John Hall's mix? I remember when I loaded up in my Pro Tools session, it was very quiet as a mix. And uh, uh, I bumped it up by 8 dBs. So, um, it, this would have been something that I would submit to mastering, for example, um, I would I would definitely mix uh, to, um, louder, yes. So I would add eight dBs to the peak, to the to whichever dBs the, this mix was peaking at. Because um, they're mixing too quite quietly, then um, I think it really does affect the, um, uh, the dynamics and the, the, how the frequency behave at those uh, those volumes. So uh, I don't know whether that would have been like a case of like a master being down or um, or just literally just being mixed at low volume. But I would mix a slightly louder. Volumes. What do you what do you aim for when you're mixing? What what uh, meter level? 
It's kind of really depends. As long as I've got like uh, a few degrees of headroom that I feel like I'm okay. Um, because I also don't want uh, to keep, to mix too quietly for, and then for the tracks to feel disjointed when in different sections, feel like there is too much of like a, a jump um, yeah. for the uh, louder section between the quiet and the louder one. So apart from the uh, overall volume of that mix, I also felt that perhaps the instruments could have been a little bit more defined. So having a look at each instrument and carving out uh, some frequencies and, and enhancing others and giving them their own space so that they can then coexist together instead yeah. of sounding this. It sounded a little bit small, a uh, little bit small just because it felt like each instrument could have covered uh, a bigger space uh, if that space would have been just for, you know, cover, you know specifically for that instrument, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, uh, the top end of the vocals was a little bit harsh, I thought around nine to 10 K. Okay. It had just that little um, fitness that I think once you then play a track very loud then it really comes through and uh, it makes your ear a bit tired. Well, I know it adds excitement, but I think there is a quality of having our smooth vocals because then you can really just turn it up quite loud yeah. without it being piercing. So the vocals as well is something I would look at. Can we dig in a little bit on vocal technique? Because it's, it's such the, uh, the cherry on top, isn't it? So what, what sort of typical things might you do to nine out of 10 vocals? You'll go, I've got a vocal here. This is a plug-in chain I would use quite a lot. So usually, well, I will start with any cue. I would cut any rumble uh, on a vocal that uh, might be due to um, the uh, a cable hitting the stand or like the singer uh, tapping their feet. And then I will add a compressor, I like the 1176 uh, or the LA-2A. This being in form or either um, uh, plugins or, or uh, um, analog equipment. And after that, I will add another EQ and then I will cut again uh, below 100 and I will look whether the 200 area is um, uh, is a little bit too much because a lot of the time it is. And uh, I don't want the kind of the effects from a vocals that makes me feel like the uh, uh, the singer is, is breathing into the microphone um, unless that is wanted. I mean, like, you know, unless we're mixing Serge Gainsbourg or someone like that. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, usually there is a lot of, uh, air that comes out of the voice and so I don't want that to just you know to create any sort of artifacts so I will look around the the low mids and 200 and 400 because then if we cut 200 then I will look at the double that frequency to check whether they are problematic as well and then I will look around 3k because sometimes microphones have a little boost around that area and it's not always pleasant so cutting a little bit of 3k sometimes will gain you that smoothness that um, you know, if you're making a track louder at the end of it with a um, compressor or a limiter, then it's gonna pop out. So it's something I usually cut and then keep on mixing. And then at the end, um, well, say like three quarter in the mixing process, then I look into cutting the, uh, the higher frequency because I don't want to lose them uh, on the finish. Uh, I will, I always remember to add a deesser, which is uh, if it's probably the most uninteresting plugin ever, but it does a lot because again, when the track is loud and it's master, all those s's and all the symbols they're gonna they're gonna shine through a bit too much. And then uh, I'll probably use a multiband compressor um, and go and uh, compress the bottom end of the vocals a little bit less, uh, let's say a lot, you know, compress a lot the bottom end and then not as much all the other bands going up. Uh, and then after I've done that and I'm happy with uh, how the vocal sounds is a dry signal then I start adding my effects. Before we go into effects, there's a perennial battle, I think with uh, placing vocals that the de 
will tame some of those attacky frequencies. Um, but a very modern sound is, is that really high saturated cutting through vocal. How do you get the two to work together? So it's really like a knife cutting, but it, the, the S's and T's are, are not gouging your ears out. I think it's kind of the secret to go and cut those frequencies out from the other instruments. So that then the vocals does shine through and it's not about adding um, high frequencies to the vocals, but it's just making space for them to exist without being piercing. Uh, I think that works a lot and also making space in the stereo field for the vocals to exist. So if there are things that might, um, might go and, um, and be in a conflict with the vocals, I and that might be like a synthesizer that's got a lot of high frequency, I push them to the side and so that the vocals can be in the center and can be uh, as loud and as, um, as stop any as they want, or I'll do the output, the output, whatever uh, sits in the middle, and then I'll put the vocals. If they are stereo vocals, I'll just put them on, in, on left and right. Yeah. So moving on to typical reverbs and delays, what, what sort of things do you might you use, Marta? On delays, I really like the H delay by waves um, on, uh, on lo fi mode because I think that smooths out too much of like the, without it, you know, with delays, you can go and, and cloud the, um, the diction off of vocals sometimes, especially when like we use a stereo delay. And I always try and use delays that are delay times that fall in, in between, so like uh, not super straight delays, like um, like a eighth or a fourth. Um, I quite like dotted delays because they do either is space in between the vocals if there is, and they, they add a nice texture. Uh, or Echo Boy uh, sound toys is really good too. I really like the uh, that it has a saturation at the end of the uh, chain. <coughs> and other delays are that I use, well, I, I've got a few tape machines, so I use those for delays too. Uh, I've got PR99, there's a Revox and it has very speed, so that I can tune often I can to the BPM of the track or like whatever it feels um, natural. And, uh, and you know, by feeding it back onto itself, back into Pro Tools, I can um, create all sorts of patterns and uh, it just has a different quality from the digital delays. Um, and then following that reverb again, like Valhalla, or there is the, um, the EMT 140, which is an emulation. Um, with that uh, Universal Audio brought out, yeah. uh, but also Waves. Yeah. So those two are really good. Um, What's reassuring, Marta, again, it's um, <coughs> like the drum miking, it's not an array of expensive tools. Like the H delay is not a lot of money and th there are lots of um, 140 plate delay uh, reverbs are out there, which are very affordable. So it's kind of what, you, what you're doing with them and your, your ears and experience. So that's, that's quite a nice thing for our audience to take from this. Thank you for that. Ken, have we got any, um, any other questions? Yeah, a couple of we'll questions. Actually, questions. it follows on nicely um, with the vocal questions. So have you done much work with vocoders and vocal synths and any tips on how to balance them with the clean vocals alongside them? Yeah, I often get uh, vocal stems that include a vocoder or similar effects. And I often try, and for example, use two different compression um, attack on uh, layers like vocoder. So I will add a, a, a compressor on the main vocoder and then a compressor on the vocoder. And then the vocoder will have a faster attack um, so that the, the diction is all down to the main vocals and um, effectively I'm compressing more the vocoder so that you know the difference, the, the speech is not going to cloud up. Uh, the main vocal clarity. Um, I will try and, and carve out some of the um, presence of the vocoder. Uh, if it is a layer, obviously, of the vocals, I, sometimes it is a, uh, the main instead. <clears throat> I would cut out maybe around 3K uh, of the vocoder and around maybe 1K and, and 6K. Make sure that it just it sits there and it sits there as a layer um, without any sort of harshness at all, because otherwise it just, it just goes and it gets, it gets 
it's in the way and we don't want that. Yeah. So I will, I will decure it slightly different to make space and compress it harder. Thank you. Let's go on to our next mix, which is Stephen Randall. Before we go to Marta for comments, we've got some people in the chat room just saying, who is this? Where can I find out more? So it would make sense for those of you who've had your mixes played, just to put your socials in the chat room so everyone can follow you and find out more. Buy a t-shirt, see a show, buy some vinyl, whatever. That would be really nice. Um, what do you think to that, Marta? I was really into that too. Um... And it reminds me of uh, an album I mixed recently that um, uh, in which I really worked really hard to address uh, what I call like a frequency soup, which is the low end slash low mid. Um, frequency continent, sometimes of a track uh, like this one is very prominent. And uh, what I what I worked hard on is trying to give each element its own space, but you know, sometimes there is a lot of elements that maybe exist in the same frequency range. Yeah. Um, like for example, here I will really look into the low mids and go and make sure that uh, each element doesn't have uh, too much of the low mids that perhaps it doesn't need. I remember I made a note when I listened to it, it was around four minutes. There was a new synth line that came in and to me it felt like you perhaps said too much of the low mates that they didn't really need. Uh, and as I was listening through it, I kind of like my attention was dragged to this synth, right, this new synth coming in rather than staying with like the hypnotic elements that kept me, kept me there up until that point. Um, so I would just go and like very surgically check uh, the, the air of like 200 and 400, making sure that the, uh, like this, the sub is there and is constantly quite present because I think that's also like a really good 
um, element for, for abstract LIDAR is to just have a great subcontinent. Um, and because it's irreverently being quite long, um, perhaps I would add a little bit of like moments of like spot delays or spot reverbs, if that is the kind of thing that obviously the artist who yeah. is into Stephen, um, to just like keep the, um, just to keep the listener um, always tuned in and like keeping the, the, um, the, um, the attention high. But I think that, you know, there is, a, I take great joy in getting lost in a long track that has got very minimal changes too. So it's just very a question of like the artist uh, choice uh, rather than mine. As it is. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, have you got any tips for placing bass at the correct level in a mix? And actually an extension for that, and some people in the chat room asking about the vocal level, that the two things that are quite hard to place, too loud, sounds disjointed, too quiet, it's buried. Same with bass, it's difficult. So have you got any tips, Marta? You know what, sometimes it's hard because it varies between song and song. But yeah, of course. I, I push it up until it feels too loud. Um, I always try and do that with, with, with many, many aspects of the mix. I, I push up until it sounds too loud or I add, uh, I add a, a compressor that might have the, the output, uh, like as a default uh, settings quite high. So like suddenly it, it will refresh in my ear, like, oh, I was missing the bass. Oh, there it is, okay, and then I will adjust it. So do something drastic um, and listen to something else that you really like or listen to another track by another artist uh, and then switch back to your track and check what uh, it feels like. I mix against my own mixes sometimes too to check that I am kind of like hitting a, cons a consistent bass level or vocal level. Yeah. Vocal for me <laughs> is very important to um, to have them not too loud. So that I, I mean, I'm from Italy and Italian mixes have all, on the radio always been very, very, very loud vocals and almost on top of everything. Yeah. Um, I mean, two vocals that sit above the instrumentation, but not hovering above it, it yeah. need to be part of it. So I think as long as you can specifically go and tell uh, every single word and uh, you know, automate for me, it's very important to automate the end of words so they don't get lost, especially when like, if a singer yeah. is running out of air. I think that's a, a good element. In terms of like level, to be honest, uh, DB wise, there isn't a rule. Um, but I would always say, like, to your ear, it sounds like you can follow the lyrics, and that's yeah. that's it. So you'll automate the tail <coughs> words so, so the diction comes through. And do you do you mix generally at a specific volume, and and your dims on one control louder on another, so you've always got a, a consistent volume, or is it just you turn it up and until what's comfortable? Overall mixing, I'm talking. Oh, about. overall mixing. Yeah. So it depends on different. Um, um, monitor controllers, but on mine, I always mix. Uh, I mean, it's not going to mean probably anything, but around 40 and 40s. Would that be DB? No, I don't think so. Um, not because it goes down to zero, and that's not. Uh, so I would always try and mix at a level that um, it doesn't fry your ears because if you mix very loudly, then you're going to last for an hour, and then your ears are going to start being very tired. That means they're going to add high frequency because your ears are losing that with the tiredness. Yeah. It's the first thing that goes. Yeah. Um, that's what happens in a club if you don't wear uh, earplugs. So you, the first thing that goes would be uh, the high frequency. Is just as you enter a club, it, like at least that happens to me. I'm going like, oh my god, this is very loud. After five minutes, I'm like, oh, that's kind of alright, and that means they're getting into trouble. Yeah. Plus, if you add a drink or two alcohol, what it does is why you can't really drink when you're mixing. I never yeah. do. Um, it does exactly the same. So it kind of puts some sort of like filter and it shaves off the high frequency. So you then yeah. start adding them. And then the day after you listen back to your mix and it's all treble. Yeah. So, you know, so that. And you mentioned about taking breaks and listening to other, other mixes. Do you have any favorite references that you go to, either of your own or anything from the beginning of time what are your favorite references gosh well 
Uh, there are a few mixes of mine that I quite like. Uh, one of it is Ella Minus, um, song called Day. And, I love that uh, album. Yeah, I really love it too. And I think it's just, you know, it's, the chemistry was great and we were sort of on the same page uh, with wanting to push uh, like the, the processing and it just ended up being one of, you know, one of the records that I listened back and I, I, I just really, I really enjoy it. Um, and uh, what else? I think I refer back to uh, Holly Herndon, because it's another record that I felt I, uh, I was really happy with the mixing on it. Um, uh, there'll be The Gates by Bjork, which I really love uh, for many reasons, but the dynamic of it to me is something that I, I worked so hard and, and so it's kind of became my to my, my benchmark uh, in terms of like, you know, the, the vocal, the level of details and the vocal automation. And then I listen to other uh, mixers uh, work. I mean, obviously David Branch, who's been, who's been my mentor and I learned from, and uh, I will listen to, um, of, of, um, I remember a few tracks by Kendrick Lamar that I really liked, the yeah. uh, low end, or like some other hip hop mixes. I really, because you know, the, the low end in some mixes is just so good. Um, and then I'll just also listen to, to what's going on in the pop world. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I just, out of curiosity, and uh, I'll try and pick. Um, a mix I'd like that. What was the last one I Perhaps a Dua Lipa mix. I try and understand what's going on behind all the elements in it. I just think it's a good, it's, it's good method to to try and then replicate. There is a record which I really love, and it's Double Negative by Low. Uh, yeah. And on a production level, but also on a <laughs> sonic level, that's outstanding to me. Um, it's mega loud. But it's also mega smooth, and to me, that's that is the sweet spot. Um, I realized that that record has no symbols, uh, and it's like okay, there is a quality to it. Kind of like it goes against a lot of um, maybe like guesses or like if you want something louder and more exciting, you just add the top end. But not actually, you you can have way more uh, power if you just push the warmth and a slightly lower frequency range such as that i think it's a very clever record you know that's a, that's a great album as well it sounds amazing doesn't it mm -hmm. um okay let's go on to the next mix um by luke eaton <laughs> Let go 
Luke Eaton, Marta, what did you think to that? Um, with this track, I, I really like the guitars, uh, the sitting and the sound and um, the placement. Um, I think with the drums, uh, the element of like how, how roomy they are, it's really cool, but what that brought up is perhaps too much low mid in, in the mix. Um, so look at the low mid and the drums um, uh, as a whole, perhaps. Uh, and uh, the snare sounded good. I like the tone of it. Um, one other thing that I would add uh, in the drums is maybe some automations, like the drums to come up for the choruses to just give it that lift. Um, and same with the vocals, sometimes I lose them a little bit. So I will maybe raise them for the same sections. Um, and it, we could play with the uh, with different effects for the uh, for the courses, perhaps. I just wanted to add a little bit more, um, a, little, a little bit more like identity to each, to each section of it, just to make it a bit more dynamic in, in, in its journey. Yeah, so you'd look at automation on the drums and the vocal to lift the, the whole arrangement a little bit. In terms of the drums, um, do you often um, compress the whole drum bus and do you often saturate or distort the whole drum bus? Is that something you might do regularly? Yeah, often I would add an SL bus compressor on the uh, drum bus. So like send everything to one auxiliary and yeah. then send that to the, well, then add as an insert. And then for saturation, I like to run that parallel. So yeah. I'll create an auxiliary and then uh, I'll often do it in Pro Tools because that will have no latency and well, very next to nothing latency. So I will use uh, obviously either the Capitator or um, there's a Sound Toys one now that the name um, escapes me. Um, there's a, the Sound Toys, uh, equivalent of the decapitator um, or decapitator and just send the uh, auxiliary, the, uh, the drum bus to it, and then also send the bass to it too, so that the drums and bass will gel together better, yeah. especially that really helps when maybe maybe the track was recorded uh, not with the, uh, the drummer and the bass player not in the same room not at the same time yeah. just gives it it just gels it together a little bit more <coughs> brilliant thank you for that ken have we got any uh, questions in the chat room yes we have we've got one about how long did it take you um to 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 do uh, to learn your mixing and then to get to the level that you felt confident at to then start to work with lots and lots of artists and yeah you know, more of the commercial artists as well Right, yes, it's, it's quite an interesting journey, the one with like um, self-confidence with mixing, because it takes someone else to tell you, oh, that's good, mm -hmm. for then building a sort of confidence that allows you to um, work on other people with confidence. So what happened to me is that I, I always um, had my own projects going on on the side when I was a, uh, an assistant and an engineer for... Um, for studio uh, uh, for other people. So I worked um, in, a, in different studios, uh, came up from being a runner, so making teas and coffees and uh, sitting quietly, quietly at the back of the, the room and trying to understand what uh, the mixer or the engineer or the producer was doing, taking notes and then uh, try, to, try to replicate what I learned during the day uh, on, my own spare time, I would either come in the studio earlier or stay in later and then pulling up a mix or the same mix. I would ask them, well, do you mind if I, you know, if, if I take notes and uh, I save these as and just try and have a go or, you know, I would just really been eager to, to learn uh, and, and then put it into practice. So like during the weekends, if there'll be any downtime, I would ask the studio manager, can I come over and clean up the studio? and have a few hours to myself. Um, so it's a lot of practice and it's a, an everyday thing. So, you know, religiously every day mixing something. Um, then it kind of starts becoming some a sort of language that you can speak, um, not only, you know, within yourself, but with others and the artists. And you're 
essentially mixing a, as production is trying to translate what's in your head, an idea into sound. And uh, the way you do that is through technical knowledge, but also intuition and uh, kind of, I guess, like emotional intelligence. Uh, so I was working with David Branch and at some point he said to me, would you like to mix this B-side for Bombino, which is a Tuareg artist? Um, I said, wow, well, yeah, this is my first uh, job on a record label, Partisan, I think it was. And he said, I'll, I'll check the mix for you. So to me, that was, that was a great level of um, comfort to know that I was going to mix and then they that you are 100% trust and I learned from me was going to listen to the mix and tell me what, what he thought. Um, and that was my first, uh, let's say, commercial mix. From that onwards, it was a mixture of, um, you know, having to dive into it and go for it. Uh, David uh, helped me, put me forward for jobs when he couldn't do it. Uh, other bands that I always worked with on the side uh, started getting uh, recognition, maybe getting signed. And so uh, to the record label, they would say, well, we work with Marta on downtime. How about we get her in and like actually get a budget together? So it's all like word of mouth um, support, uh, working really hard and uh, really wanting to, to learn everything you can. And at some point there comes a time in which you realize that um, you have the confidence to, to, to do anything you, you want and, and you know that you know how to achieve it. That there are always going to be one or two projects in which you doubt yourself. And that's fine too, because that's an element of growth that is always, is always present in the job. That's why I, I love it. Uh, but you should never put you off from, from carrying on. Thank you. Question? Yeah, um, just going back to vocals again. Um, it, it, have you got any tips for mixing quirky and recording quirky vocals or quite unique vocals? I mean, do you use the same process each time, or would you just decide on on the on the, on the style of vocal and and adapt it? Oh, oh gosh, well, all vocals are quirky. Uh, so I guess I'll just go and like uh, work on. Um, whatever material I have. So, for example, like I mixed this record by Holly Herndon, there was uh, the vocals uh, often were coming from an uh, artificial intelligence uh, computer. So that was really uh, like a new approach to me. I had to address it without uh, my, well, kind of like apply my knowledge of mixing vocals, but on a very different level. Uh, I would I would have like a few staple things I would do such as cutting the a low end that doesn't need to be there and compression and multiband, but I would definitely that there, there comes a, a point in the uh, signal chain as in insert wise in which yeah I've done all my you know uh, all my homework and I cut out the frequency that don't sound right and then there comes the creative part of how do I fit these vocals into this track and that's always like specifically tailored for each song. Thank you very much. Um, should we have another mix? So this next one is by David Major.
Marta, what a change again. What do you think? Sorry, I was muted there. That's okay, um, you're back. I'm back. So, yeah, very different flavor of that. Um, I will be curious to know whether the drums were um, programmed or just very, uh, very uh, on, on the Greek greeted, I'll say, because they, they felt quite. Um, um, that to me they felt quite sampled and that perhaps just added a rigidity to the track that I would have liked to be a tiny bit more organic because they kind of like, it, it sounds a little bit too artificial uh, to me. So I will try and, and, and smooth that out if possible by maybe like adding different, maybe adding uh, another layer, another sample to the choruses just to have a lift mm -hmm. uh, or softening the, um, uh, the drums in the verses literally were like EQ or like open and open it up for the courses. Uh, like that would make the uh, perhaps the, the journey to the track a little bit more dynamic. Um, uh, but, but, but the vocals sometimes uh, I lose them again. Like I will just put a little bit of time towards automating them, especially there was a fast part. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That one, I, I lost the vocals there a little bit, like I could not follow. Um, so yeah, especially for that part, I felt perhaps an automation would have really uh, yeah. helped. Uh, the synths, the synths were a bit too loud to me, comparing to the guitar, because the guitar had a, a good volume. And I would perhaps either cue the synths with a little bit of top and down to make them stand within the track a little bit better, mm -hmm. um, or just turn them a touch down in favor of the guitars. That's, that's where, just where my idea is when I listen. Yeah. Now, the, the difference between this track and the other guitar bass tracks, the guitars on this are quite shiny um, and less raucous. When you're mixing guitars, electric guitars, have you got any go-to tips and tricks you could share with us? I, well, I quite like having like guitars quite wide in in the mix. If they've been recorded with uh, multiple microphones, I, if I would record guitar, I would always use two microphones on um, on each amp, um, so that I can pan them when I mix. And if I cannot do that, then I would add a send to a stereo delay, yeah. and I will use that. Especially, I will uh, raise that for the chorus so that the guitar just suddenly sound wider. Um, so that's for um, electric guitars. Um, and also the, the really important with the electric guitars is that uh, the fact of like not thinning them out too much because otherwise they, they can sound very, very quite um, tiny. Yeah. <clears throat> so always, you know, obviously you don't want to, you don't want to have like a swamp of low frequency or low, low mid frequency in the mix. Uh, 
because an amp to guitar also often has that. But so keep keep an ear out for the body. Uh, and some amps, a lot of amps, have a peak around 3K, which gets in the way of the vocals. So if there is a track with vocals and rare electric guitars, I will keep an eye um, on those frequencies too. And what a part of your journey is is engineering. So you're not you're not just an inverted commas a producer and mixer. You've done a lot of engineering in the past, haven't you? So for example, you did you worked on Bon Iver's album. What what do you did you learn from the engineering process that you bring with you to uh, mixing and, and production? Are they all it's, feeding into one soup or or are they quite compartmentalized? So maybe they're all part of the same process because I, I couldn't help but always thinking um, one step further, whenever I was engineering, I would think, well, I want to make these as good as, as if I be mixing it and I, as if I'll be delivering it to, you know, the artist record label or to the yeah. listener. So I always make things sound as good as, as, as possible. Um, always thinking uh, as if I'll be the, at the end of the chain of responsibility. You know, I always feel um, 100% responsible and I've, always want to deliver uh, whatever it is, even if it is a demo, uh, the best it could be. So when I engineered, I remember I will be thinking about the mixing side of it. Uh, and then when I am now producing, I'm always thinking about the mixing side of it because I often end up doing both of those uh, yeah. drops on a record. And I, I am mixing as early as placing microphones. To me, placing microphone is part of mixing because yeah. you, you then end up, you know, if I know that a track will uh, at the end of the day have these many elements and I know how I want it to sound, uh, ultimately I would just start from the, from, with that idea from the, from this, uh, That's a really good tip. Again, it's back to the room and the performance and the, and what you've got in the room. It's feeding right through to the mix, even at that early stage. That's really interesting. How many projects that you produce do you end up mixing? Is it most of them? Is that part of the deal? Or are you quite open to other people mixing your productions? It only happened once that I produced something that someone else has mixed. And uh, it was really interesting and I loved it to hear uh, a mix um, uh, of one of my productions, essentially to hear a track uh, I've made with the artist in through someone else's ears. And I, I love the freedom of it. Um, right now, I think that it, it's kind of, I've got such a defined idea that it's easy if I end up mixing it. But also, equally, I'm really open to for the artist to say, no, no, I just want to uh, produce a record with you. And then I've got this person who I trust to mix. And that's also fun because I know yeah. where responsibility starts and ends. So it's both, but usually 90% of the time I mix while I produce. And are you engineering as you produce, or depends on the budget? I now tend to always hire an engineer, um, which is um, uh, whenever I can, and most of the time would be Grace Banks, uh, who's worked with me for a few years now, and I trust her fully. So uh, I think that, you know, having come up as an engineer, and it's just so very meticulous, uh, as an engineer, I, I feel like I am. Uh, I really need to trust someone fully to be able to um, let go and uh, and not worry about that side. And I really trust it. So that's for me is a very, a very you know, very rare and, and lucky position uh, to be in. Yeah. So you know, it's relinquishing uh, well, relinquishing powers. I think it's delegating and um, responsibilities, which. It's a big part of the job and the learning curve because um, at, at one point engineering is everything I was doing um, and she operates at such a high standard that it makes me feel um, free to just sit back and listen rather yeah. than worrying whether there's a microphone cutting out or yeah. whether you know that um, needs to evolve change and engineering is a hugely uh, creative uh, position to be in and I think is intrinsically um, intrinsic to music production. When you are engineering, you're also producing really, I think. There is always, it's never a clear cut. It's always a great area yeah. um, in the studio. Um, Thank you. Can we got any uh, 
chattering questions for our next mix. Yeah, just um, got a question from Lauren here. It's uh, International Women's Day. We've had uh, Mandy Parnell, Sylvia Massey, Susan Rogers, and obviously yourself. Um, do, do you think there's still an issue um, in in the music industry? Uh, is it getting better? Um, what are your thoughts on that? It's from Lauren. Uh, there's definitely an issue still. Um, it is getting better, it is, because I remember when I uh, sort of uh, decided that I wanted uh, to be an engineer, uh, I did so without having a role model. And, and I suffered from that. Um, um, I both suffered and I was both um, excited to be doing something that I, I, didn't, I, I wanted to become more normalized. You know, so to, to have a woman um, behind a desk. Uh, so I started doing uh, learning engineering when I was 16 back in Italy and I was working in live sound. Uh, and my environment was predominantly uh, male dominated. I had a, a mentor, uh, Carlo, who taught me my first, um, uh, the first, first knowledge I had like microphones and and signal flowing uh, very patiently. Um, and then, you know, live sound, especially back then, I come from a small town, uh, was mostly men. Um, and, but I had the luck to, to start in an environment that was also uh, very open-minded. And uh, you know, as a, uh, I was working from a, um, a kind of activist, uh, Headquarter and uh, I was uh, looking after the the place, the one of the few independent venues um, in my hometown. So the the environment there was really for thinking, and I never felt um, uh, I never felt discriminated back then. I just felt a lack of representation strongly, and I moved to London and. Um, also in London, there was a lack of representation, even more so than I thought, because I thought, wow, well, this is uh, effectively almost European capital, you know, of music. And um, still here in London, the women they were doing what I wanted to do. I could count them on the 10 fingers. Uh, I think the more uh, I made connection, the more I discovered that there are there are many of us around and we need to we need to keep doing this not just for ourselves but because we are going to be the role model for someone else mm. um and there is some sort of responsibility there i think um and, and uh, yeah there is there is a i think there is a duty that um the top um let's say the the top level of uh, the music industry um CEO wise you have in terms of rebalancing uh, the whole situation because there's been a long time uh, in the history of in the recent history of music uh, women have been effectively uh, being penalized by the fact of just being women and and not just women you know like they represent the other representation of any sort of diversity in the music industry at the top levels is, is quite uh, it's quite something to witness um, so Things are changing, and I feel that things are changing. I really do feel it on my skin. So I'm confident. Um, also, always, uh, you know, try and and never, never um, let myself be comfortable. I always, always keep an eye open and try and bring people up with me. Uh, you know, try and bring another engineer up, and I try to give back because I, I received a lot. Uh, I think uh, I feel very very lucky to be where I am and so I feel also there is a duty to you know put them back into the community. And have you got any advice for um, women in the industry starting out? Um, a question, follow-up question from Lauren about women who maybe feel quite dismissed in studios, how they can overcome that and, uh, and progress? Well I think is ultimately you just need to, you need to keep on going, like not listen to anyone who tries to talk you down and probably 
think that the people who try to talk you down, they are probably driven by jealousy, insecurity, and the problem is theirs, it's not yours. Yeah. And it would be a great loss for music if you wouldn't do what you do. So please keep on doing it uh, for me too. You know? right. So just keep at it. Thank you very much. Right, I'm going to go to uh, another mix now. Uh, Will Robertson for some electronica. What are your thoughts? I was really into this track as well. Um, I really like the dynamic. I, when I listened to it on my system, uh, I said from the beginning, and there's a, a great lift from the intro into the beat. Um, and that felt really, really satisfying to me on the big speakers and, and on the sub. Um, I made a note specifically uh, where there is a small gap in between uh, uh, when the first time the beat comes in, another second time, I was almost expecting some kind of change. So either there, I hear a, a pad in the background, like a synth pad, could have um, been rising throughout that second uh, part, or maybe the sub bass could have. Like, I was just eager to to hear more of it, something, some some kind of level like yeah. uh, uh, change in there. Um, I like the mixture of the acoustic and the electronic elements in it, in the piano and everything else. I, I like the space in which they coexist and I think it's very defined. Um, uh, there was, I, I've got time codes for the original track, so like there was another small gap of three minutes, 10, uh, which again, I felt I was expecting something to kick in because everything is almost, it felt very organic, but also quite mathematical. Um, and with that in mind, at the end, I think it, this, uh, and this is a bit faded in before uh, this element that I'm going to um, uh, 
mention now that is at the end of the track, just for the artists in case they are listening. Um, there is the scent, the cue on the scent uh, changes suddenly, but not on a bar, not on, not on an actual interval, like everything else has been changing before it. And that just took me by surprise because with tracks that I feel they're almost like so satisfying because I feel like I'm so within it and I almost kind of almost anticip can anticipate and what's coming up. Uh, if you've given me that throughout the whole track and then at the end you take it away, I was like, oh, we just needed two bars over there. <laughs> um, so yeah, there was like a, it wasn't on the, I, I would have put like the change of cue. I was trying to keep it quite rhythmic because it just, just really feels very satisfying. Um, there were parts in which I wanted to hear this, the, uh, the sub more because there is space for it. Everything is just yeah. very clear. Um, yeah, just the way they construct itself throughout uh, that end part. I think I would have just looked at it a little bit more um, to make it, make it nice and, and defined. Thank you. Yeah, it's really a great track. Ken, some questions. Uh, there's one actually that, that cropped up earlier. Desert Island plugins, Marta. If you were on a desert island with only 10 plugins, I don't know what you'd be doing on a desert island with plugins, but <laughs> if you were, what would they be? I would just be tanning in the sunshine, hopefully. But if I'd be mixing somehow, <laughs> uh, any sort of EQ for me would just, you know, keep me happy and it doesn't matter what it is my EQ uh go to EQ is the Pro Tools EQ and if I will be using Logic it will be the Logic EQ um so any EQ of any sort because you can do so much for EQs and um we probably have the one compressor the 1176 um I probably have uh Valhalla uh Vintage Verb the H delay I'll have the um, the Devil Lock, which is the name of the uh, Devil Lock. Yeah, Santos, brilliant. Santos Devil Lock. I'll probably have um, Doubler by Waves. I have um, I'll have uh, a, a multiband uh, compressor, either a, a C4 or a linear MB. Uh, I have a limiter when I want to have a party on the island by myself. <laughs> Make stuff loud. Um, I have our base because I think is sometimes, you know, it, it comes very handy. And what was that, eight or nine? That's We're on nine, bit. give us one more. <laughs> one more, well, I really like, if on an island, I could not take my tape machine, I'll take the, um, uh, the ATR tape emulation by um, Universal Audio. Brilliant, thank you. Good choices, Ken? Yeah, we've got a, got a question from Leah Sanderson, and uh, she's a vocalist, um, and she's saying how any tips for a, a absolute beginner on the production journey, sort of equipment maybe, and just how, how do you actually start out to, to make her um, home demo sound, sound good? Um, I will save up for like, uh, uh, well, we can start with, a let's say, like an SM58. Uh, which, you know, is a hundred pounds microphone, um, a mic stand, and the, uh, you, don't, you don't really need a pop shoe because it's within it, uh, and a pair of headphones with a sound card, which doesn't have to be a very expensive one. It can be, you know, a, a focus right, or your, um, any sort of um, sound card you like. Uh, so set up um, mic stand 58 going into the sound card, um, going into your DAW of choice, uh, a pair of headphones, and just record yourself. To record yourself as much as you can. Um, I'll say that, like, for vibes, uh, set your gain level so that it doesn't peak. And then maybe add a compressor if you can track with a compressor because it's just gonna, um, uh, just gonna, you know, make it sound make it easier to sing, uh, while you're finding, uh, Maybe you're, uh, you know, maybe you're building your relationship with the microphone. Uh, sing perhaps with a bit of reverb as well, because I, I think it, it can help uh, a lot. Uh, some people really don't like reverb, but most of 
uh, companies I, I work with, they a, a little bit of it will help with like this feeling of like, claustrophobia when you're on your headphones and singing. And uh, so just like practicing uh, with that, like for, you know, you tend, I tend to get used to new headphones or new microphones, like after a week I use them. So just give yourself the time. Brilliant. Thank you for that. We've got time for one more mix and a few comments. And then uh, we're about there, Marta. So the last one. And this is um, someone called Ellie Ellis. This is that song for the party on the island you're going to have, Marta. That's a nice way of ending the evening, isn't it? Exactly. You just what find you me in, on an island trying to mix this track <laughs> without no power whatsoever. Um, yeah, I really like this. I think uh, all the drums sounded uh, on top, and I really like them because the uh, kind of the rhythm that I just, um, you know, I, I was, uh, I was really hooked on and. Uh, if anything, I think I would perhaps just raise uh, the vocals on the beat were really clear, but the other elements I could hear a guitar in the background. I would raise that a little bit more um, for the for the vocals. I would like backing vocals slash. Uh, like, I don't want to call it backing vocals because sometimes they feel like the main. But the group vocals, maybe I will experiment experiment with uh, a little bit more uh, more effects and make, make them a little bit wider. Uh, I really like CLA vocals for that. It's just that one plugin that's got it always got a widener and it has a, 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 a good sounding reverb, although I would always add a Valhalla on top of that. Yeah. Um, and it has a, a good compressor, it's up and down, you know, it's sliders, it's very easy plugins. Um, that always works for me on backing vocals. Um, it's basically like a chain of a lot of my favorite plugins. Yeah. So, yeah, so maybe just. Um, Doing more automations on the uh, on the other elements uh, that are not the the, uh, the vocals and the, and the drums because yeah. they sound good. 
um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Well, we're almost at time, but can I just uh, end by saying thank you so much for joining us and taking the time out of your schedule. It's really nice to have someone who this time next year will have a Grammy <laughs> and are working with so many amazing artists that your discography speaks for itself. So thank you for taking the time.